Okay. Okay. Hello and welcome to today's class. So, um, as I mentioned earlier or last week, um, classes will be every Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Today's topic is business organizations. Um, the objectives that are going to be covered. <clears throat> First, we're going to look at types and basic features of business enterprises. We're going to look at the sources of funds for these different business enterprises. Um, we're going to look at privatization and commercialization. And finally, we'll look at indigenization and nationalization. Okay. So business what is a business organization? It is an enterprise established by individuals, groups of individuals, or a government for the purpose of providing goods and services to satisfy human wants. Um, can I ask that you mute your mic, please? There's somebody's mic that isn't muted. Thank you. So what are the different types of business organizations? I said, could you mute your mic, please? Because there's some feedback. Thank you. So the first business organization we're going to look at. Uh, you unmute the mic. No, mute it. Put it on mute. Because I can hear you in the background. Is that clear? Okay. So types of business organizations. Um, we're gonna look at sole proprietorship, also known as sole trader. We're gonna look at partnership, um, the two types of partnerships, ordinary partnership or unlimited partnership. Then we're gonna look at joint stock companies with private limited liability and public limited liability. Then we will look at cooperative societies the consumer ones, producer and credit corporate societies. And then finally, we'll look at public enterprises, also known as state-owned enterprises. So a sole proprietorship or a sole trader um, is a business enterprise owned, managed and controlled by a single individual. It is essentially a one-man business. Only one person owns the company. What are the features of the sole proprietorship? As I mentioned earlier, it's owned, managed, and controlled by a single individual. The initial capital or money um, used to start the business is provided by the sole proprietor. Um, it's usually common in retail trade and artisanship. It has a simple organization structure. And then the owner bears all the risk and takes the profits because he's the only one that you know, is involved in the business. What, what are the advantages of this um, type of business organization? It's easy to set up because there's you know, no formality involved. Um, you can make decisions really quickly because it's only the one person involved. You can have secrecy of your business affairs because again, it's just one person involved. And then it only requires a small amount of capital to start as well. The other two on the, um, on the slide are that the owner enjoys the profit alone and it's easy to manage efficiently. But as with all things, as there are advantages, there also will be disadvantages. So the disadvantages of sole proprietorship is that the owner's liability is unlimited, meaning that if there is any sort of issue, the owner has to take full responsibility. That's li liability um, essentially means responsibility in terms of the financials of the business. Um, expansion is also difficult because there's only one person, um, there won't be essentially enough capital to expand. The owner, even though they will bear all the wins and all the profits, they would also bear all the losses if the business fails. Um, because it's a one-man business and we said, you know, lack of access to huge amounts of capital and that it would be most likely a small business, 
the owner can't then face competition of um, with bigger firms because you know there would be a lack of economies of scale. And finally, there is a lack of continuity after the owner's death. If the owner should die, essentially, um, there's no there's no I guess a low chance that the business will continue after that. So we've looked at um, sole proprietorships. Let's look at partnerships. This is a business enterprise in which two or 20 people combine their resources to set up and run with a view to making a profit. So most businesses or businesses in the private sector essentially set up to make a profit. Um, the sole proprietorship we looked at earlier intends to make a profit. The partnership as well intends to make a profit. So under here, we have two different types of partnership. We have ordinary partnerships where all the partners have unlimited liability, similar to the um, sole proprietorship where if anything happens, all the partners are essentially liable to paying any debt, any sorts of legal um, issues that may arise, all the partners are liable. Whereas in a limited partnership, most partners would have limited liability. So they would not essentially be affected if the business runs into any financial difficulties because they wouldn't pass what they've put into the business. They themselves, the money outside of their business can't be touched. So what are the advantages of a partnership? Um, as I said, it involves multiple people, not just the one person. So there would be access to larger capital than the sole proprietorship because all the different partners can come in and provide you know, the money to start up the business. It's also easy to set up because there's a lack of formality. And the fact that you, know, you have different partners in the business, each one's allowed to, comes with their own specialized um, specialist knowledge, it will essentially enhance productivity in the company. Again, because there are multiple people, the risks will be spread across the partners and there is continuity in the business because if one person dies, because it's not just a one-man business, there's, it's likely that the business will still continue. On the flip side, let's look at disadvantages. So um, like I said earlier on, there would be unlimited liability in um, the partnership, especially the ordinary partnership that I mentioned earlier. And like I said, if that means that if the business runs into debt, they could um, take all the money of the business, but then also the money of the partners that was not even involved in the setting up of the business. Again, because there's only a certain amount of people that can be involved in a partnership, you may still not have enough capital to expand. Um, because there are multiple people in, in a business, anytime you have multiple people, there is bound to be disagreement between people and that may slow down the progress of the business. And that may also slow down decision-making. Now, I know we said that if one person dies that the business can still continue, but then think about what if you have a partnership where there is an active partner and who does the majority of the work and most of the other partners don't do as much. If that person dies, then it could also lead to you know the dissolution of the business because of that rule. Next, joint stock companies. So these are um, companies that have a separate legal status from those of their owners. So earlier on, we we're talking about liability, and what I was saying was that um, the, the other the other companies have essentially unlimited liability, the partnership and the um, and the sole proprietorship. Whereas with joint stock companies, these ones have limited liability, meaning that the, um, the legal status of the company is different from that of the owners. So if the company it runs out of money, you can't go then take out, take money from the, I guess, the owners to pay the debt. We have two different types. We have private limited liability companies and public limited liability companies. 
A private limited liability company is a company that has a minimum of two and a maximum of 50 shareholders. Its shares are not traded on the stock exchange and no shareholder can transfer their shares without the consent of others. So when you start this company, everybody comes in and you decide on how much, um, how many shares they're going to be and how it's going to be divided between the different people in the company. You can't alter that and or to alter that, you have to make sure that everybody else is in agreement. Whereas a public limited liability company is different. It's not private, it's, you know, it's public, it's traded on the stock exchange. Um, it has a minimum of seven and no maximum number of shareholders. So um, it shares, like I said, are traded on the stock exchange and shareholders can transfer their shares at their will. So think of uh, last time I was talking about MTN and how MTN was issuing shares, right? Anybody can buy shares on um, MTN shares. I can buy, you can buy. It's a public, it's a public limited liability company. And, you know, all the other owners of um, MTN shares don't know when other people are buying shares of the company. So let's look at the private versus public limited liability companies. Private, like I said, two to 50, whereas public, it's seven to unlimited shareholders. There's no, there's no maximum. In the private, shares are not traded on the stock exchange, whereas public limited liability companies, shares are traded on the stock exchange. Um, like I said, you can't freely transfer shares between um, within a private limited liability company, whereas with the public, you can. And finally, with a private limited liability company, you're not required by law to publish your trading results, whereas with public limited liability companies, you must. So what are the advantages of this type of company compared to say the other two that we've looked at? There's large capital from, for example, from the sale of shares or from debentures. You have expert management in most of these companies, which enhances efficiency. And then members, I think this is probably, you know, a huge plus for this, members enjoy limited liability. Risks are shared over a large number of people since it's no longer just, you know, the two people or the one person. And continuity is almost definitely guaranteed in this type of company. But then, like I said, with all advantages come some disadvantages. You don't have privacy, especially with the public limited liability companies that must publish their trading results. Because you have anywhere from two to 50 in the private and seven to like, you can have over a thousand in the public, decision-making can be slow and cumbersome. The fact that you separate ownership from control often affects managers' performances. So for example, you would have managers in a public or even a private, in a joint stock company that may not necessarily own parts of the company. And so they may not necessarily care about, you know, a lot of the things that the owners may care about. Finally, it is expensive to float due to legal formalities. So the next type of company we're looking at, cooperative societies. We have consumer cooperative societies, which consists of a combination of buyers. So what happens here is that different buyers will come together and they will buy goods in bulk and then sell at a reasonable price to their members. So let's say I have a group of friends and we all want to buy, a good example would be say um, tomatoes. If you buy, you know, five tomatoes in the market today, the price that you would get will probably be a lot more expensive per unit than if you're buying, say, over 2,000 tomatoes, because they will give you a discount for a bulk buying. So that's what the benefit here would be. Producer cooperatives, it's a combination of sellers. So think of small producers like farmers. And what happens is that a bunch of farmers will come together and the producer cooperative will buy the goods from the members, from the farmers, and then market them outside for higher yields. Finally, we have credit cooperatives. And I think this is probably the most um, popular one that people know is when a group of people come together 
and I guess put money together, put money to um, put money into say into the group, and at different points, different people can borrow the money that everybody has put out. It encourages savings because the more money you put, let's say you put money every month, that means it's growing, and essentially anybody in the group can borrow the money from the group, but then we need to pay back at an interest rate. What are the advantages of cooperative societies? So it would reduce exploitation by middlemen because here it is the people, you know, if you're a buyer, it's the buyers that own it. If you're a seller, it's the sellers that own it. Um, you know, it, there's democratic decision-making, which will enhance the members' commitment to the groups. You don't need to advertise because, like I said, your customers are your members. And profits that are made are shared amongst the members in the group. Finally, a corporate society does not pay tax. But then there are disadvantages. For example, there could be poor management due to democratic consideration rather than merit in the selection of the executives. There could be corruption because of illiterate leadership. Leaders often involve in partisan politics. So rather than doing, you know, voting for who you believe would do the right thing, you're voting for people based on popularity or certain types of, um, you know, traits that you may share with them. And finally, sometimes there might be insufficient capital, which will hinder the expansion of you know, the enterprise. Now, the last type of um, business organization we're going to look at are public enterprises. These are businesses that are set up, managed, and controlled by the government. So all the other ones we looked at were private enterprises. This one is public. It, like I said, is fully owned by the government. It has to be established through an act of parliament. It's set up to provide goods and services to the public. So a lot of um, countries would have, say, the electricity company or the electricity sector owned by um, the government. So the water is owned by the government. So that would be a public enterprise because it's there to provide certain goods and services, and it's set up to provide certain goods and services to the public. It's managed by a board appointed by the government and it has a legal status so it can sue and be sued. Why would the government want to own, um, I guess an enterprise in the first place? So like I said earlier, it provides essential goods and services. And sometimes these goods and services would not be provided by the private sector. Um, if you look at other um, topics in economics, we'll look at um, free rider problem, um, public goods, and the fact that certain goods by the, will not be provided by the private sector because there's no benefit to the companies in providing them, even though they may actually be really good for society. So in this case, it would be great for the government to step in. Um, it prevents exploitation by businessmen for a lot of companies. Um, it prevents, you know, private monopoly if you have nationalization. So what I mean by this is that there could be a sector where a lot of the companies might be, say, banding together to become a monopoly. And we know that if you look at, I don't know if we've studied um, monopoly with the other teacher yet, but essentially um, the issue with monopolies is that they tend to exploit consumers and they tend to fix really high prices because it's only that one company that you can buy all your goods from. So if you want to avoid, the government would obviously want to avoid that because it doesn't want consumers paying really high prices. And what it would do is that it would say, okay, let's nationalize this monopoly so that the government will now own it as opposed to it's being owned by the private sector. Next thing, another reason for government ownership would be that it may want to provide employment opportunities for people in the country. So someone like Nigeria that has high unemployment, it may create you know, public companies so that it's able to employ people and also raise the standard of living of citizens in the country. 
it could decide that I mean, um, the government could decide to, you know, open a public enterprise because it wants to diversify the economy. Say it thinks that there are not enough companies in a certain sector, and it wants to increase the amount of production in that sector. Um, that would be a reason for government ownership. It could be that it wants to prevent foreign domination. So say a certain sector again in the economy is owned by a lot of foreigners. You could decide that actually I, they don't want this and they would want to take back some of this ownership for people in the country. And finally, like I said, or related to the standard of living, government ownership ensures that there's even distribution of wealth and resources. But as with all things, there come problems. So what could be problems of um, states owned enterprises? The first thing, and I think is very common when people talk about civil service jobs, or, you know, just the civil service in general, especially in Nigeria, is there's red tapism and bureaucracy. So there's a lot of bureaucracy and administrative difficulties in state enterprises, which tend to make quick decisions, um, quick decision making very difficult. And so you end up with, you know, slow, slow turnaround and a lot of projects or just, um, I guess, not fast enough um, services in general. There's also a lack of initiative. So if you own a business, you would want bold and progressive policies because I think that's what success is. That's what, that's what causes success for a lot of businesses. But in state-owned enterprises, this is, this is lacking because they, you know, the state has to be accountable to the public and to parliament. And the fear of failure might not allow the states to take such bold and progressive decisions. There is less competition with, um, I guess, state-owned enterprises, and that kind of fosters inefficiency. So, like again, I said, with the civil service, a lot of civil service um, civil service services are usually, you know, known for being very inefficient, and that's because there is no competition to drive that um, sense of urgency and productivity. There's also a lack of personal interest. When you have in the private sector, because you're motivated by profits, because you own people that own their business, there is this sense of you know, pride and genuine interest because you've set up that business. But because you don't have that in the in state-owned enterprises, the people that may run it don't necessarily have a personal interest. It could cause a lot of inefficiency, as we mentioned earlier. And finally, um, there's a loss of consumer sovereignty because if most public corporations produce at, on, you know, under monopolistic conditions, meaning um, there's only one, one of that type of company, then the customer may not have a wide variety of goods to choose from. Let's look at, um, an easy example would be say the energy sector. So electricity in Nigeria. Um, I don't know what the state of it is now. I think it, it might have been privatized, but it's before it used to be just one you know, electricity company owned by the government. And when that happens, you know, people in the country only have that single electricity company to choose from and to, to buy their services or buy electricity from, which is not really great because you know, you want a variety of goods to choose from. You want to be able to decide, okay, this is where I want my electricity provider to be. And also, like I said, it would, it would, it would um, foster competition if there were different, um, different companies, but there aren't, there's just one owned by the state. So let's look at where, where all these different companies get their funds from. So if we start on the left, sole proprietor, they get them from personal savings. So like I said, sole proprietor is just one person that decided to start a business. How do they get their money? They 
probably from their personal savings. They could get grants from friends or family, loans from friends or family, loans from the bank. And then when they make profits from their business, they reinvest it again. Partnership, again, will be savings from the different partners. Another way they could get funds is by admitting a new partner. So they've started the business and they want to add another partner into you know, the partnership. The partner would have to put down some money, like a buy-in. They could get loans from the partners. And again, they could reinvest some of the profits to building the business again. Joint stock company, though, similar to the others, but also has its own differences. Um, a key difference for the, especially the public limited liability companies is that the way it gets its money or its funds is by selling shares. Another way would be selling debentures. And like the others, if you get loans from banks or reinvest the profit. Cooperative societies would have member subscriptions. So to you know, join in to the, the cooperative you put down some money as a subscription. They have fines and other penalties that you know they charge some of their members if they fall out of line. And like the other two, loans from the bank and undistributed profit. Finally, looking at public corporations, slightly different because those are private. This is owned by the government. So the way this even starts is that the government must first of all inject capital. That's the first way that public corporations are formed. The government is the first source of capital. Then you could have loans from banks and other financial institutions, for example, development banks. Um, you could have donations from people. They could reinvest the profit. And then the last one I'll touch on is tax exemption and relief. And this is where you don't have to, so you don't have to pay tax because you're a public company. So we've looked at, the last thing we looked at was um, public companies. Now, if we look at privatization, this is when, sorry, the last thing we looked at, yeah, was big companies. So if you look at privatization, this is when the government sells off government corporations, that's public corporations, to private individuals. So it's basically transforming a public enterprise to a private enterprise, i.e. privatization. Commercialization is slightly different. So you have a state-owned enterprise, but then you're making it become profit-oriented. You know, earlier on, I mentioned that state-owned enterprises typically um, they, they're not necessarily profit driven. And so they don't, um, there is kind of a lack of incentive to do better, to make bold choices. But if you then commercialize it, you're making it become purely profit oriented. And so the things and choices that the, co the company will make will be slightly different. So like I said, so on the bottom here, we said, State-owned enterprises are not meant to make a profit as the products are usually subsidized. However, when they become commercialized, they can now operate as a private firm and make profit. So what are the advantages of privatization and commercialization? So these two would essentially, they're essentially changing the dynamics of the public company. One is making it private completely. The other one is making it profit oriented, similar to a private company. And the reasons you would do this or the advantages of this are that it promotes efficiency in production. It brings about innovation and creativity. It promotes competition. And ideally it should lead to an increase in consumer satisfaction because you have all this you know, innovation, creativity, um, competition and efficiency. And finally, the government will actually gain more because there will be an increase in tax and profit revenue. But it comes with its disadvantages. So it could lead to an uneven distribution of income. It could fuel inflation 
because there would be higher prices. It may lead to a reduction in the employment level. So when a company is trying to become efficient, it could decide to, for example, lay off some workers, which would um, increase unemployment. And it may lead to consumer exploitation if not careful. The next thing we're gonna look at is indigenization. This is um, the transfer of ownership and control of business enterprises from foreigners to indigens. It's designed to ensure that there's greater participation um, for indigens in the ownership control and the management of the business. So earlier on, I mentioned that um, the government may decide to start public enterprises because it feels that you know there are a lot of foreigners that own um, companies in the country. Another way to deal with this problem would be to say that okay, um, these foreigners have to transfer control to nationals of the country, indigens of the of the country. So say from Americans, if they're Americans that own companies in Nigeria, from Americans to Nigerians, so that Nigerians have a greater participation in the ownership and control of the business. Um, so this leads to local retention of profits for the country, because if, if not, if it was just owned by Americans, Americans would take their profit and take it back to America. But if you know, Nigerians own the company, then the profit stays within the country. It ensures that there's greater participation of indigents in the control and running of the business enterprise. It reduces foreign control and domination of the nation's economy because if you have too many um, too many companies that are owned by um, foreigners then you're essentially causing harm to your national economy because a lot of the money that these companies may be making even though they're making it within the country they're actually taking it outside of the country and finally it eliminates the problem of dependence on foreign goods But if a government decides to, you know, um, indigenize some of the companies, it can lead to a loss of FDI because some companies may just pack up and leave the country. And yeah, leave the country. Um, it may lead to inefficiency if you know you transfer the management of a business from people who are doing well to incompetent people. It could also discourage friendship between countries. So I used America earlier. Um, the American government could then become unhappy because you're essentially causing problems for its nationals and also its economy as well. So it could cause friction between the Nigerian government and the American government. And if you're not careful, the economy could become weaker rather than stronger. Finally, the last thing we're going to look at today is nationalization. It's a policy through ship of private enterprises due to economic, political, social, and strategic reasons. So think of this as kind of like the opposite of privatization and, um, and sorry, the, the other one that we looked at. Because with nationalization, what happens is that instead of it becoming private, it's becoming public. It helps to check exploitation. If private companies or even its workers, um, if you turn it public, then the government will make sure that consumers are being properly taken care of. It helps to eliminate and prevent wasteful competition. If you know companies within a sector are just competing in a way that is harmful, then by making a company um, public, you could prevent this. If you want to eliminate monopoly by private companies, you would also and that an advantage of nationalization would be that it, it eliminates this. And finally, it ensures the provision and a steady supply of essential services. So think back to one of the reasons for. Um, you know, public enterprises, I said that it may be to provide um, a service that would not otherwise be provided in the private sector. So this would be also an advantage of nationalization because, you know, 
the governments would essentially be providing the service. Disadvantages include, you know, it may lead to consumption and mismanagement. It may lead to the misallocation of resources and it can lead to low productivity and efficiency. These are essentially the disadvantages of um, having a public enterprise in the first place or a government owned enterprise. Thank you. Um, the meeting will end in about two and a half minutes. So um, if there are no, quite, I'm gonna put the, sorry, I'm going to put the test into the chat so you can access that. Um, and are there any questions I can take real quick before the meeting ends? I hope that I was clear. Um, yes, I will share the slides to, to the email mentioned. Great. Um, well, thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope to see more of you. So please um, spread the word so that more students can join. Um, thank you for tuning in once again, and I will see you all. Okay. Bye.